Hi everyone, I hope you're all well. So on September 18th, Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg very sadly passed away of cancer at the age of 87. RBG, as she was affectionately called, was a pioneer for women in the field of law and led an extraordinary life. As Donald Trump put it, even if you don't agree with her politics or with some of her decisions, she was an amazing woman who led an amazing life and I was genuinely saddened to hear of her passing. Now, of course, this has monumental political implications. There is a brutal tug of war between Republicans and Democrats over whether Donald Trump should even be allowed to nominate somebody to replace her since this is an election year. And if the appalling fiasco that was the Brett Kavanaugh nomination and confirmation in 2018 is anything to go by, it is only going to get uglier. See, the big issue here is that Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a liberal and therefore contributed to the liberal influence on the court, even though, you know, technically the justices are supposed to be impartial. But since Trump is president, he is obviously going to replace her with someone more conservative. Now, this is a massive deal because he would be increasing the conservative majority on the Supreme Court from 5-4 to 6-3. And since justices can serve on the court for life if they choose, that would lock in a large-ish conservative majority potentially for decades, thus putting a stopper in any kind of progressive agenda the Democrats might want to sneak through the court. Now this is terrible news for the Democrats, particularly this close to the election, which probably explains why the reaction from Democrats and the left at large, literally from an hour after it was announced that poor Ruth Bader Ginsburg had passed away, was effectively if you replace her, we'll burn the place to the ground. Literally. And they have the hide to accuse Donald Trump of inciting the unrest. So. What is the big controversy about Trump replacing Ruth Bader Ginsburg before the election? Well, the supposed controversy is that in 2016, when Barack Obama wanted to replace the late Justice Antonin Scalia with Merrick Garland, the Republicans railed against it because, among other reasons, it was an election year. Now, the Democrats this year have latched on to that and are accusing the Republicans of hypocrisy by insisting that their actions in 2016 set a precedent about not appointing Supreme Court justices in an election year. However, that's not technically the case. The circumstances in 2016 were really quite different in the fact that Obama was not up for re-election as it was the end of his second term. Trump, on the other hand, is up for re-election. Therefore, the people do have a say when it comes to the choices he makes. The second reason is that in 2016, although the Democrats obviously had the White House at the time, the Republicans controlled the Senate, which is of course responsible for confirming new justices. As Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell and others have pointed out, no Senate has confirmed an opposite party President Supreme Court nominee since the 1880s. So technically the precedent is actually in the Republicans' favour. Also, on a less official but no less notable note, it is worth considering Senate Judiciary Committee Chairman Lindsey Graham's thoughts on the irony of the Democrats trying to lecture the Republicans on how and when to confirm Supreme Court justices. Being lectured by Democrats about how to handle judicial nominations is like an arsonist advising the fire department. <laughs> as he put it rather elegantly in a letter to the Democratic Senate minority. After the treatment of Justice Kavanaugh, I now have a different view of the judicial confirmation process. Compare the treatment of Robert Bork, Clarence Thomas, Samuel Alito, and Brett Kavanaugh to that of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sonia Sotomayor, and Elena Kagan, and it's clear that there already is one set of rules for a Republican president and one set of rules for a Democrat president. I therefore think it is important that we proceed expeditiously to process any nomination made by President Trump to fill this vacancy. I am certain if the shoe were on the other foot, you would do the same. Plainly put, and fair enough, I would have thought. In any case, it's not just the Republicans who are flipping on previous statements about appointing justices in election years. Take a look at what the Democrats had to say about it in 2016. The American people deserve a fully staffed court of nine. The president nominates and then the Senate advises and consents or not 
but they go forward with the process. What we're seeing here, and, and I hope this is temporary, is a disrespect for the Constitution. The Constitution is 100% clear. The President of the United States has the right to nominate someone to be a Justice of the Supreme Court. Senate's function is to hold hearings and to vote. As it turns out, Trump seems to be going ahead with the nomination despite the threats of violence or the emotional blackmail from Democrats over the fact that according to her granddaughter, Ruth Bader Ginsburg's dying wish was that she would not be replaced until a new president is installed, which seems kind of weird language given the fact that that could be four years from now. Anyway. It seems that the favorite to be nominated is Amy Coney Barrett, a former law professor who clerked for Justice Scalia and was appointed to the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals in 2017. She comes glowingly endorsed by her colleagues and has a number of qualities that make her an ideal pick. Namely, she's a conservative and also a devout Catholic, which will play well with the religious faction of Trump's base. She's also an originalist in the way that she interprets the Constitution, which will again play very well with the Republicans. In addition, she's only 48, which means she could potentially be serving on the Supreme Court for the next 40 or so years. In fact, it was reported that Trump nearly picked her ahead of Brett Kavanaugh to replace the retiring Justice Anthony Kennedy in 2018, but held off because he was saving her for Ginsburg. And since she was reported to have visited the White House this week, it's likely that on Saturday she will be announced as Trump's nominee for the Supreme Court. And boy, what a crap show will ensue from there. Amy Coney Barrett, should she be nominated, is going to get attacked like no woman in the public eye has ever been attacked. And by the very people who kept insisting in 2016 that every time Hillary Clinton was criticized it was unfair because she was a woman. You remember how Brett Kavanaugh was brutalized in 2018? You remember the smear campaign? You remember this? Well, buckle up, Bessie, because Amy Coney Barrett is going to cop it even worse. I mean, Democrat supporters were already smashing things and turning up to Mitch McConnell's house in the early hours of the morning last weekend when RBG had barely died and it wasn't even fully clear yet who the favorite for the nomination was. That's how tacky and power crazed they are. But how are they actually going to attack Amy? I mean, it certainly won't be on her, on her judicial credentials or decision making because that's not what Democrats do. They've got so used to being a smear machine over the past few years that they don't even bother trying to argue their case on its merits anymore, if it has any. Which is stupid in this case because concerns have been raised about Amy's record of siding with big business and excusing misconduct, both of which would seem legitimate things to pin her on in the hearings. But of course, the Democrats won't do that. They are so far beneath that that they have practically tunneled their way down to Brisbane by now. So what cards are they going to pull? With Brett Kavanaugh, it was easy to choose. They just pulled out Old Faithful, which was, you know, a baseless accusation of misogyny plus a murky historical allegation of sexual assault. However, since Amy is a woman, they're going to find that line of attack a bit tricky this time round. Also, a lot of the more moderate male Democrats and left-wing commentators are going to have a hard time going really heavy on Amy Coney Barrett because they're also terrified of being called a misogynist. The regressive leftists don't care about this, of course. They don't believe it's possible to be misogynistic towards conservative women because they see us all as gender traitors who deserve to be abused and punished. But the normies will not like it if they see the media unnecessarily trashing the woman who is in line to fill the Ruth Bader Ginsburg seat on the Supreme Court. So which way do they go with their trashing? Easy. 
they're going to paint Amy Coney Barrett as a religious cultist who was so steeped in religious extremism and kooky rituals that she can't separate her religious beliefs from her application of the law. They've already started doing this by drudging up her involvement with a charismatic Catholic group called People of Praise which apparently teaches that wives should submit to their husbands, calls male leaders heads, and until recently called female leaders handmaids, which has since been changed to woman leaders for obvious reasons. Anyway, fake news stories started appearing in outlets like Newsweek and Refinery29 saying that People of Praise is the very group that inspired Margaret Atwood to write The Handmaid's Tale, which depicts a dystopian alternate reality in which the government has been taken over by a fascist hardcore Christian sect that enforces brutal patriarchy and punishes and imprisons non-believers. However, it turns out that People of Praise is not the specific group that Margaret Atwood used as inspiration for her novel and now hit TV series, and in fact she didn't use a specific group, it was simply the type of group that she used as inspiration. Nevertheless, the articles, even though corrected quietly, were already out there, and because regressive leftists don't ever seem to bother with corrections made to articles once their confirmation bias is indeed confirmed, it's all added fuel to the fire that Amy Coney Barrett is going to immediately overturn Roe v. Wade and along with Brett Kavanaugh, usher in a new era of Catholic religious extremism. The Washington Post, of course, fanned these flames with this tweet by WAPO writer Ron Charles. Amy Coney Barrett, the judge at the top of Trump's list to replace Ruth Bader Ginsburg, has said we should always remember that a legal career is but a means to an end, and that end is building the kingdom of God. Now, if you know anything about Christianity, you'll know that this is not a literal statement. The kingdom of God varies from the idea of Jesus as God's presence on earth to what's present in the heart of Christians, to Christian practice itself, even to the idea that we should all be working towards a better world that mimics heaven on earth. It's not a statement of intent to create some sort of tangible religious caliphate. But if you know nothing about Christianity and you are a fervent, Trump-hating, atheistic Democrat who sees Christianity as a competing interest to the progressive cause and you watch a bit too much TV, you're going to conveniently interpret that as Amy Coney Barrett being a vessel for Christian fascism that will see the Kingdom of Gilead a la The Handmaid's Tale instituted in America. It's very, very stupid behavior, really not befitting grown adults, but here we are. 2020's wild, y'all. This attitude was epitomized in this now-deleted tweet by filmmaker Arlen Parser. Trump's likely RBG replacement, Amy Coney Barrett, is a Catholic extremist with seven children who does not believe employers should be required to provide healthcare coverage for birth control. She wants the rest of American women to be stuck with her extreme lifestyle. There is just so much wrong with that tweet. Probably why Arlen deleted it. The anti-Catholic line is not new. She was subject to this during the hearings when she was appointed as a federal judge in 2017 because of an article she had written in 1998 about being Catholic and a judge. Even though she stressed multiple times in the hearing that her personal and religious beliefs would have no bearing on the decision she made as a judge and nor should they, she was still subject to comments like this from Democratic Senator Dianne Feinstein. When you read your speeches, um, the conclusion one draws is that the dogma lives loudly within you. And that's of concern when you come to big issues that large numbers of people have fought for for years in this country. Bear in mind, this absolutely would not happen to her if she was of any religion other than Christianity. No way. And it's also vaguely unconstitutional since the Constitution denotes that there shall be no religious test for public office. So what's going to happen, and I can see it now, if she gets the nomination, the Democrats are going to portray Amy Coney Barrett as an extremist religious kook who thinks birth control should be banned and whose sole mission it is to overturn Roe v. Wade Wade while they tacitly slut shame her for having lots of children. Even though, regarding Roe v. Wade, during her confirmation hearing to the appeals court, she said that in that role she would follow all Supreme Court precedent without fail and would regard decisions such as Roe v. Wade as binding precedent. And she added that she would never impose her own personal convictions upon the law. She could not have been clearer. 
But of course, the Democrats are not going to care about any of this. They don't care about facts. They are in panic mode and are going to scramble and scrap and threaten and fearmonger and whine and do anything they can to make this as difficult and as horrible as possible. So if Amy Coney Barrett does end up being nominated, let's send her some collective strength and good vibes in all seriousness. She is going to need them to withstand the terrible onslaught that could be coming her way. If you liked that video, please remember to like, subscribe, share, leave me a comment. And if you really, really liked it, then check out the video description for my subscribe star link and other ways you can support me.